Hello, my name is Kyle Schneider. I'm from Kentucky State University College of Agriculture, Food Science, and Sustainable Systems. I'm going to be talking about genetic structure among four populations of paddlefish based on microsatellite markers. Uh, the first question is really why are we interested in genetic diversity of paddlefish? And, and the reason is that paddlefish have a high conservation value. They're an ancient species. They're the only extant species or the only living species in the family Paleodonidae. And they're important species for commercial and recreational fisheries throughout the central United States. And many of these populations have declined due to river modification, loss of spawning habitat, pollution, and overharvest. For aquaculture, paddlefish is a high value species for row and boneless meat production. So we also are interested in whether or not paddlefish exhibit genetic uh, diversity that might be exploitable for aquaculture for some, sort of, for some form of genetic improvement, something like increased fecundity or early maturation, which would be important for caviar production. Paddlefish genetics is relatively well studied. Um, previous studies focusing on mitochondrial DNA uh, and allozymes demonstrated relatively low levels of genetic variation among pa natural uh, populations of paddlefish. The high polymorphism you get with microsatellites provides a little bit more of acute level of information for detecting subtle differences among populations. And Heist and Mustafa 2008 uh, surveyed 12 pa populations of paddlefish at five loci, and they demonstrated that nearly all of the analyzed populations exhibited significant genetic heterogeneity, which means that these populations were significantly different from one another. And the most distinct was that of the Tom Big B River, which is in the Alabama River drainage. Our research objective was to perform a more broad range survey of genetic diversity in, in the paddlefish uh, based on microsatellite analysis and focus on major river systems in the paddlefish's range. So paddlefish were collected from four sites, the Ohio River, the Alabama River, the Red River, and the Yellowstone, Missouri River. This is a sample locations. If you see, uh, the purple is the native range of the paddlefish. So the blue is the Yellowstone, Missouri population uh, in the northwest uh, region of the paddlefish's range, the Red River in the southwest, um, the Ohio River in the northeast, and then the Alabama River in the southeast. I'm not going to go too much into this, but initially we screened 20 microsatellites, and then we selected eight that exhibited disomic inheritance, uh, and we used those for amplification of alleles, and they're listed here. We resolved the amplified products uh, using capital electrophoresis, and we determined fragment sizes using gene mapper. This is just a summary of the primer data. It's nothing too important um, for probably most of you. I'm not going to get into any of this, really. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, sort of what capital electrophoresis is, this is sort of how we look at the data. So we fluorophore label the primers to amplify genes. They get hit with a laser as they pass through a capillary. They emit light, and then we can view it um, like this. So this would be an example of a heterozygous genotype for paddlefish. This is at locus D8. This individual has alleles 252 and alleles 260. So why are we looking at disomic loci? Um, well, really it's because uh, when you're looking at tetrasomic loci, especially in the past when you're using gels, this isn't so much now that we use capital electrophoresis, it's difficult to, to tell which alleles are which due to uncertain homology of the bands. It's hard to separate the products. The, more recently, and the reason why we wanted to look at disomic loci is because tetrasomic loci can complicate statistical analysis when duplicate copies of genes cannot be determined in, in, in individuals with two or three alleles present. So basically what this is, is if you have an individual that's heterozygous for alleles A and B at some tetrasomic locus, or they should have four copies of a gene, you don't know how many copies of which gene they have. This affects gene frequencies, and then when we run stats, it's kind of hard to determine where this comes from. So we wanted to focus on disomic loci. So this is a bunch of statistical analysis that we do on the data. You have two types of diversity. You have within population diversity, which is how different individuals are within a population from one another. That's things like observed heterozygosity, 
expected heterozygosity, the number of alleles that you'll see in a population, or the alternate number of genes that are in that population. Allelic richness, which is the same way of looking at number of alleles, is corrected for differences in sample size, uh, which we can then statistically compare. And then we look at deviation from hardy warming e equilibrium, also known as inbreeding coefficients, to see whether or not there is, is random mating or non-random mating in these populations. Between population comparisons, or is population A different from population B? These are things like private alleles, alleles that are unique to only one population. Uh, fixation index, this is basically saying that alleles in a population are fixed for the same alleles, can take a value from zero to one, zero being the populations are identical, one being the populations are completely different from one another. Also genetic distance, which is a similar estimate. And then we can look at heterogeneity tests to see if alleles in a population are drawn from the same frequency. So even though populations may appear very similar based on the alleles that we find in those populations, the frequency of alleles might be very different. So just some quick results. The eight loci that we looked at were all polymorphic and produced from two to 18 alleles. Uh, we amplified 81 alleles across all populations at all loci. And the average number of alleles per locus was 7.75 in the Red River population to 5.8 in the Alabama River population. Observed heterozygosity ranged from about 71% in the Yellowstone Missouri River population to about 59% in the Alabama River population. If we look at this in terms of allelic richness, which you can statistically compare, you can see no, no real difference in the level of within population diversity between the red, yellow, Missouri, and Ohio populations. However, the Alabama population did have significantly lower number of alleles per locus. <coughs> Expected heterozygosity, a similar result. Uh, no difference between the Yellowstone, Missouri, and Ohio populations. Uh, the Red River, not different from Ohio, and the Alabama, significantly lower from the yellow Missouri and Ohio populations. If we look at Hardy-Weinberg deviation, so now we're interested in, in random mating in a population, or if there is random mating. We did see deviations in two of 32 locus exact tests. Uh, these occurred in the Ohio River and Red River populations at locus D111, uh, FIS of 0.19 and 0.23. So this indicates that there's a deficiency of heterozygotes in these populations at these loci, which suggests that there's some possible inbreeding. Um, an overall locus exact test revealed uh, departure from Hardy-Weinberg in the Ohio River population. Again, non-random mating potentially in, in that population. If we look at between population comparisons, which re really this is sort of more interesting for uh, this talk. Um, based on FST, we had an overall fixation index of 0.07, which sort of is a moderate level of genetic diversity between populations. Um, if we look at pairwise comparisons of comparing populations to one another, you can see that the Alabama population is quite a bit different above the diagonal is FST. The Alabama population is quite a bit different from the Ohio, Red, and Yellow Missouri River populations. And this is similar based on uh, genetic distance to the greatest distance between the Alabama population and the other populations. Um, as far as the Ohio Red River and Yellow Missouri populations being similar, uh, there's actually, uh, for Red River and Yellow Missouri, this is not significantly different from zero. So essentially these, these populations are fixed for the same alleles. And if we look at terms of genetic distance, a, a different result, but again indicating how similar these populations are that no real measurable genetic distance between Ohio and Red River populations. If we look at this in terms of dendrograms which is a little more visual you can see the clustering of the Ohio, Red River, and Yellow Missouri populations based on both FST and genetic distance with FST putting Red River and Yellow Missouri more similar and genetic distance putting Ohio and Red River more similar together with Alabama being an outlier. If you look at genetic differentiation, um, for 19 pairwise comparisons were significant. Um, 
we saw significant heterogeneity in the Alabama River compared to all other populations of, at six out of the eight loci. So this is saying that the Alabama River population is different from the other populations in terms of allele frequency distributions in six out of the eight loci. And the only ones that weren't significant were locus C6 and C10, and that's because there are only two and three alleles at these loci across all populations. Also, the yellow Missouri population significantly different from Ohio at locus D9. I think this, this uh, is more uh, indicative of, of the results than anything else. If we look at private alleles in these populations, so alleles that are unique to these populations, we see that there's a similar number of private alleles in all of the populations. The Ohio had four private alleles. The Red River had three private alleles. The Yellow Missouri actually had the most with six, and the Alabama River population had five. But if we look at the frequency of private alleles, you can see that in about 12% of the individuals in the Alabama River population can contained a private allele. So that's saying that not only are these alleles unique, they're also high frequency in this population. And if we look at locus D111, for instance, where there were three private alleles, 38% of the individuals in this population contained one of those private alleles. So again, it's a very unique population. One other thing just to note, locus C6, uh, there was a private allele in the Yellow Missouri River population. There are only three alleles observed across all populations at this locus. So to have a private allele when there's only three alleles is pretty unique. So that's something to be noted also. <coughs> if I could just summarize the results, uh, the Ohio Red River, Yellow Missouri River populations, similar levels of within population diversity uh, when you compare a number of alleles, a little measure of genetic differentiation between these populations. If we look at the Alabama River population, low intrinsic diversity, so not a lot of diversity within the population, however relatively distinct from the other populations. Um, the findings of this study for the Alabama River population are similar to those reported by Heist and Mustafa for the Tom Bigby mm -hmm. River population. Uh, this, is, you know, this has kind of been seen in the past and it's well noted that the Alabama River drainage has been separate from the Mississippi for 25 to 30,000 years, so you should expect to see differences in these populations. Um, and also, uh, the, the Tom Bigby River and the Alabama River converge to form the, the Mobile River, so these populations kind of intermix. Um, and in contrast to the findings uh, of Heist and Mustafa, little ge genetic differentiation was observed among the other populations sampled. So in terms of conservation, uh, if populations are under artificial pressure from habitat alteration, attempts should be made to preserve low frequency unique alleles. Also attempts should be made to mitigate outbreeding and preserve the uniqueness of the Al Alabama River drainage populations. For aquaculture, it's hard to say. Um, the levels of diversity and uniqueness of the Alabama River drainage populations may indicate that uh, there is some diversity that could be selected for. It's, it's really kind of hard to say. And I just want to say thank you and questions. And I put this picture on here because the, the, the gentleman in the middle is Shu Hai Bu. He worked on a lot of this and uh, is back in China and unfortunately couldn't be here. So thank you. We have time for a couple questions.